Hello, I hope you're all doing wonderfully today. My name is Pastor Stephanie Lape. I serve at Cross and Crown Lutheran Church in Rancho Cucamonga, California. And in fact, I've been there for two years. It's amazing. Six months of it have been in quarantine, but still, it's a joy to serve this incredible congregation. So if you are part of congregation, part of the congregation at Cross and Crown or anybody else, welcome to this Bible study. Glad you are here with us. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and uh, go ahead and press the, the little bell icon uh, that's underneath the video and that way you'll get a notification when a new video comes out. So we are looking at Genesis in this current Bible study and we have gone all the way up through the end of chapter 15. Incredible stuff going on here and things that are not only an ancient story but that have relevance and meaning to our life today. If you only look at the Bible like a history book, it's not going to be as interesting, I believe, as if you can also see it as something that relates to all of us right now. It's fascinating because if we wrote our stories of today, people then and there wouldn't relate to a lot of what we're talking about. Like if we wrote about, you know, telev televisions and phones and the internet and things like that, cars, airplanes. But if you write about things that happened thousands of years ago, we can still relate. Not to all of it, maybe not to all of the farming references or that kind of rural lifestyle um, polygamy, you know, some of the things that we're reading here in Genesis, but we can relate to some of the basic emotions and the basic spiritual uh, phenomena of, you know, where are you, God, and, I you know, feeling lost and feeling um, also found and praising God, things like that. So let's pick it up now in chapter 16. We're going to be going through the end of chapter 21, 16 through 21. So if you want to pause it right now, pause the video and then read 16 through 21, I am particularly going to be highlighting Hagar and what's going on with this woman Hagar she doesn't get a whole lot of press coverage I think and she is just a fascinating character she she's one of my absolute favorite characters in the Bible like in my top five you know she's maybe even my top two <laughs> she's amazing so let's start with 16 so at this point Sarai and Abram are not bearing children and they have been promised children. And remember, this is in Judaism, the way that the Jews understand their legacy. Judaism does not talk very much about an afterlife. Now, there are some Jews who do believe in an afterlife, but it's just not the emphasis. As Western religions developed from Judaism, then to Christianity, and then to Islam, historically, they talked more and more about an afterlife. <clears throat> so Christianity talks more than Judaism does about an afterlife. Islam talks much more in their writings uh, about an afterlife than even Christianity, much less Judaism. So Judaism comes out of the original Israelites, which is an indigenous religion. And like most indigenous religions, the focus is on the earth and the seasons and um, issues of survivability, much more than issues of what's going to happen after we die more like, can we survive now? Do we have land? Do we have food? Do we have rain? Is there warfare that's going to kill us off? And one of the main interests and concerns of an indigenous religion is having children, having other people coming after us so that when we die, our people will still continue. The identity of the person is not just in the individualism of the person, but in the line, the descendants of the person. So Sarai and Abram are promised children by God, but at this point they have had no children. So they're wondering what's going on. And this is one of those things where we, many centuries later, can relate. Not only about having children, but a sense of, you know, what's going on, God? Have you forgotten me? Uh, do you not care about the things I care about? Are you not hearing my prayers? Um, you know, why are you taking so long? I seem to have infinite patience, but you're still taking a really long time. These are things that people feel universally. So Sarai decides to take matters into her own hands. And at this point, she has an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar. Now, again, we think of slavery as you know, reprehensible, morally wrong, and we would not do it. Uh, 
I'm assuming, if you're listening to this, that you would not be in support of slavery. Uh, however, this was the lifestyle that was considered normal uh, to the ancient Israelites, to the Greek Empire and Roman Empire. So in the Bible, you don't really get this ultimate message that slavery is wrong and bad. Um, so at this point, she has this slave, Hagar, and Hagar is from Egypt. And so Sarai tells Abram, hey, I got a plan. Now, this is, again, so indicative of just what humans do when God takes a really long time with something. We take matters into our own hands as if, hey, I'm God's right-hand man here. I can figure it out. And... Uh, kind of taking power away and agency away from God. So she tells Abram, why don't you go ahead and impregnate my slave girl, Hagar. And then this line that you're supposed to have, this, you know, the, the, the descendants from you will come through Hagar, but it will be your line. Um, of course, you know, Hagar is the mother, but she would really not have equal ownership. Number one, she's female. Number two, she's a slave. Number three, she's an Egyptian, not an Israelite. So really, Hagar is the property of Abram and Sarai, particularly Abram. And so his line would totally be his through Hagar. Uh, it's not even considered if Hagar is willing to do this. Uh, it's not considered that this would be a violation of their marriage vows to one another, Abram and Sarai. Uh, Abram does not protest. I mean, you'd think he'd be like, no, no, I can't possibly. But he says to Sarai, okay. You know, so that's like mm, a little questionable for Abram there. So it said that uh, in verse 3, I'm in chapter 16, verse 3, after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. This is sexual slavery, clearly. I mean, I'm not reading anything into this. This is telling Hagar, first of all, we own you as a slave. Uh, secondly, this involves sexual slavery. Can't amount to being raped. And so history would be very different if it was written from Hagar's perspective, for sure. She has no agency in this whatsoever. She has no will. She has no right in this family uh, to say no at all. She's just totally being used. Um, it's rather invasive by today's standards and uh, rather seems to me um, vi violating her, you know, and yet it's not at all described as that in this text. So she conceived, it says he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Well, it's been explained that she looks with contempt on her mistress because she's, she's now better than her mistress. She has a child or a child, uh, in the making, you know, she conceived, uh, so she's she's thinking like, well, I'm I'm better than Sarai who hasn't conceived, and that could be the case. But also, she could be angry at her mistress certainly for putting her up to this. She didn't choose to be sexually active with Abram. She didn't choose to conceive, you know. And now she's carrying this this child, which is not without difficulty. Any of you who have carried children, you're sick. You don't feel well. Uh, you're not able to do the regular things you can normally do, like move, <laughs> breathe, sleep. You know, I mean, it's not easy carrying a child. And this had nothing to do with her choice of, of, of being with Abram or conceiving a child. So she could have looked with contempt on her mistress, Sarai, uh, because of that. So for whatever reason, she was not very happy. And then Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you, I gave my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. So now she's blaming Abram, which is kind of funny because, I mean, I can see why she is. Abram's the one who slept with Hagar, but it was her idea. You know, She's the one that was like, do this. And Abraham did this. And now she's blaming 
Abram. So the whole thing is quite convoluted. It reads like an episode of Grey's Anatomy. Again, like I've said before, anybody that says the Bible is boring apparently hasn't read it because there are so many... I mean, this is like what you might call a love triangle here, although there's not a lot of love for Hagar. Uh, there's not a lot of love from Hagar for these people either at this point. But there's just so much complication, human emotion, confusion, and a lot of these human emotions would still be relevant today if it was happening today. So Abram then said to Sarai in response, your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Again, treating her like this object, going back and forth like a pinball machine. I mean, Hagar has no will. She's not listened to as much as modern day children are listened to. Nobody cares about her opinion. Nobody cares about her physical safety or well-being. Now, this is not to say that Abram isn't a great prophet. He is. He does a lot of amazing things. He has a lot of faith. He believes and trusts God. He leaves his land to go to a, a foreign land. Um, but he's not a perfect human being. I think we can admit he's not like Jesus. He does not treat Hagar like Jesus treated women at all. And so he's a product of his time and place. And women are not looked at with the kind of respect and love that, that Jesus or that God would give women or people <laughs> in that in, for that matter. Uh, Sarai also is not looking at Hagar with respect and love either. So there's a lot of complication going on here. Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar and Hagar ran away from her. Now, I have sympathy for Hagar here. Uh, Hagar ran away from her because she just was, uh, first of all, she was abducted, raped, you know, violated, no will whatsoever, no right to say no uh, to this. Now, conceiving a child that she didn't, she didn't ask for, um, and she's being treated uh, harshly and badly by Sarai and kind of ignored at this point by Abram. So her running away is, I feel kind of understandable, and yet running away and having no protection. Now as a slave, uh, at least if she was under the household of Abram and Sarai, she would have a roof over her head, she would have food and water, she would probably have a relatively, very relatively safe birth for her child and her. I say relatively because obviously in those days, the standards weren't as high as they are today. Uh, you know, there was a lot of death in childbirth, death of children and death of the mothers. Um, but it was relatively safe in that at least she had a roof over her head and she had some food and she had some protection. But now running away, she has absolutely nothing. So imagine this kind of desolation. Not only are you running away, kind of like the story of the prodigal son, where you're running away from your family and your home, but the prodigal son ran away with some money. Hagar didn't have that. The prodigal son also ran away not pregnant. You know, when you're pregnant, you don't have the physical strength in order to just kind of take any work, do any kind of jobs. Uh, the prodigal son at least worked for a pig farmer. Hagar probably could not do something like that. So she's female, she's pregnant, she's a slave, she's hated, she's unwanted. She has absolutely no resources whatsoever, no food, no clothing, no money, other than just the clothes on her back, um, expecting a baby. I mean, this is like the most vulnerable a person could be. And she ran away from everything. This is absolute desolation. So in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. So at least, thank God, there was a spring of water. I mean, that's small mercies, but at least there's something. Um, the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? This is kind of like the voice of God in Eden asking Adam and Eve, what have you done? Why are you hiding? Why are you, um, you know, where did you go? Kind of thing. Like the angel probably knows all of the answers to the question, but these questions are there in order for Hagar to have self-reflection, to say herself what's really going on. She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. That must have not sounded very good to Hagar. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. Now that's similar to the covenant, the promise that was given to Abram. Abram, who's a male, who's relatively wealthy enough to have possessions and slaves 
who's married, who has legitimate family line, Abram, who has so much more clout than her, uh, was told essentially the same promise as this pregnant, destitute, impoverished slave girl. It's kind of the same promise. You're going to have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. Uh, the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Okay, the Lord has given heed. She's not ultimately alone. She might feel ultimately alone, but in truth, she's not. That is preachable right there. That's a sermon right there. When we feel at our absolute bottom, whether you're struggling with an addiction or a financial low or a relationship low or a health low or whatever it is where you feel like you absolutely hit rock bottom, even if all your friends and family betray you and everybody has left you and all of that, you might feel alone, but feeling something doesn't necessarily mean it's the absolute objective truth of things. She might feel alone, but the Lord has given heed to her affliction. Not only does the Lord see her and see what's going on, but understands that she is afflicted, that she feels afflicted and that she is afflicted, that she's going through trauma right now. Uh, it says about her son in verse 12, he shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. Now that's a fascinating prophecy. In a way, it sounds a little negative and difficult and harsh, but in a way it sounds like, well, first of all, he's actually going to be alive when he's born. This is not going to be a stillbirth. And uh, he is going to be strong and have vitality and, 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 um, just kind of a fighting, a fighting instinct. So it actually sounds like this boy will live and thrive and do well. He might have some difficulties in that he's a so-called wild ass of a man, his hand against everyone, etc. But at least he's going to live, which is very good news to mothers bearing their children. So it says in 13, so she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy. Uh, for she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? So El Roy, El means God. If you see in scripture something called Beth El or Elohim, whatever the L is, E-L, that would be in, in English. E-L means God. And Roy has to do with sight or vision. So this is the God who sees. Basically, she says, you are the God who sees me. Um. She's the first person to name God in the Bible. And it's such an intimate moment. It's such a, a profound thing because you see me, God. God is not absent. God is not like Zeus on a mountain concerned with only God things. Uh, God is not just... Well, okay, so let's let's back up a little bit here. Our founding fathers of this country... Uh, Many of them, most of them were baptized Christians in some way, whether it was Methodist or Episcopalian, etc. But a lot of their writings talk about God in, in what is called a deistic way. Now, deism is a line of thought that says that a God created the world and then, like a watchmaker, wound it up and stepped away from it. So you know how a watchmaker would do this. They would wind up the watch and not be intimately involved with the watch any further, step away from the watch. The watch would go elsewhere, being sold out into the marketplace, and the watchmaker either would make other watches or just somehow be far away from the watch that was wound up and moved on. Okay, that is a philosophical understanding of God known as deism. So many writers, including many of our founding fathers, uh, as wonderful as they were economically, politically, getting the country started, but their theology was in many ways very deistic. Like uh, God is the master architect. We see this like with the um, the uh, writings from the Masons, you know, that God is the master architect and created the world and did all these wonderful things, but kind of isn't really involved with it anymore. Gave us the ways to keep things moving and sort of stepped away. So... Many modern day Christians speak of God this way by saying things like, well, God doesn't have much time for me, or I'm not sure God answers my prayers or even listens to my prayers. 
I don't, I don't really know if God's concerned about my life. Um, why would I pray to God for this little thing happening in my life? God wouldn't really care. All of that has a deistic undertone that God is the creator, but he's kind of left the scene. And so for her to say, God sees me, that is a very Israelite way of understanding God. God is not away from us. God has not just created the world and then left and left us to our own devices, in which case Hagar and her uh, baby in her womb would be totally on their own out there in the wilderness, maybe with a spring of water, but that's it. She knows that God is intimately involved with her life and sees what's going on. And the Israelites had that understanding of God working providentially throughout history, involved with every aspect of their lives. That then laid the foundation for Christianity with Jesus being God with us, Emmanuel. Not a God who distantly cares, God with us, absolutely caring about everything you and I go through. So Hagar, to me, is one of the most precious biblical characters to say, God sees me, and to name God Elroy. Then she also says, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? She understands that there is no mediator that she needs between herself and God, that she can have this intimate and direct communication with God and interaction with God and still live. Um, that's a beautiful thing for her to say and to, and to realize. Okay. So there was this spring there and it says that the well there was called Bir Lahai Roy. Now remember Roy means seeing and it lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram named his son Ishmael, etc. So she did go back. She did apparently submit to Sarai. Uh, and bore this son Abram. And now, of course, Abram's claiming it, you know, bearing Abram a son. Okay, that's a lot about Hagar. Now we're going to go a little bit more quickly through the other chapters. 17, there's the sign of the covenant where God says, your name shall not be Abram, but Abraham. And we mentioned last week that whenever there's a name change in the Bible, it means a change of identity. So here a covenant comes to him saying, I'm going to establish this covenant between you and all of the nations and generations, etc. And then Sarai was changed to Sarah as well as she is really Abraham's partner here. So Abram and Sarai are now Abraham and Sarah. And, um, then in chapter 18, a son is promised to Abraham and Sarah saying, you're going to have this child and the line that I've promised you will not be through Ishmael, but through your child, which we know later on is Isaac. Okay, so then it moves into uh, this situation with Sodom and Gomorrah. So do you remember in the beginning when we talked about this, we said that what really grieved the heart of God was violence. This is what made God destroy uh, the earth during Noah's day because there was so much violence going on between all these people. Well, the same kind of thing is happening with Sodom and Gomorrah, violence. This has, I believe, wrongfully been explained as the great sin of homosexuality. Later on in the Bible, it talks about the sin of Sodom uh, not being a sin of homosexuality, but really it was a sin of lack of hospitality and violence. So essentially the story is that two angels, I'm in verse or chapter 19, two angels came uh, to Sodom, the city, and appeared to be men, but were angels according to the, the, the script. And Lot, the nephew of Abraham, was sitting at this gateway. And when Lot saw them, apparently he... Uh, either recognize them as angels or just uh, was going to show great hospitality to these visitors, these guests. And then, uh, let's see, there were these people, where is it? Um, he said, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house, spend the night and wash your feet, then you can rise and go on your way. Uh, they said, no, we'll spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. He made them a feast, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Okay, so he's just showing hospitality. In verse 4 of chapter 19, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house, 
And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Okay, it is not reasonable that every single man in Sodom was a gay man. That's not reasonable. Um, it's not believed that these people were actually homosexual men, but more like they were using sexual violence, which was common to do in this day, as a way of subjugating an enemy, shaming and repressing an enemy. So basically they wanted to gang rape these people, these angels that appeared to them to be people. And so, uh, again, violence. And so in chapter six, Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. And so he's seeing this kind of violence, this kind of sexual violence uh, as, as evil, you know, lack of hospitality and violence toward these angels slash men, really angels looking like men. Now he does something that just irritates women, at least today's women. But back then, of course, we have to understand the context of the day in which women and particularly daughters were seen as not all that valuable, kind of like property. And you can sort of do with them as you wish. Like we would think of a possession like a book or a pencil or a computer today. Hey, this is my property. Just take that. Um, and so uh, it's not how women are seen today. Thank God. <laughs> By those of us watching the video anyway, I'm assuming. Okay, so in verse 8, look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them to you and do to them as you please. Hell would freeze over before I would ever say that about my daughter. So again, think of it in the context of the day. Uh, only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they replied, stand back. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and he would play the judge. And so they're now judging Lot for being a foreigner and trying to control the situation. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near the door to break it down. Again, more destruction, more violence. But the men inside reached out their hands, brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so they were unable to find the door. Okay, I, I'm not going to keep going on about this, but it's ridiculous to think of the, this as a big crime of homosexuality. What strikes me anyway, and most scholars is a crime of violence, a crime of uh, forced entry, gang rape, lack of hospitality. It's, it's what bothered God at the destruction of the earth during Noah's time. It was violence. So um, these were all the men of the city too. And so uh, basically at the end of this, uh, God rains down sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, before all of this, in chapter 18, you see this kind of bargaining between Abraham and God. God saying, I'm going to destroy this place. Abraham saying, well, but what if there's 50 righteous people in the city? Will you save it for 50? And God says, okay, I will. What if there's 45? What if there's 40? And there's this kind of bargaining. That is a great understanding of prayer. Prayer is saying whatever you want to, to God, and then listening to God's response. You don't have to say just the perfect kind of prayer. You can bargain. You can just lay your heart out there. And maybe God not only will change you, but God might change. There is scriptural understanding of God changing God's mind. As mind-blowing as that is, there is scriptural backing for that. All right. Lot's wife looked back, became a pillar of salt, which is a whole sermon in and of itself of looking backward and how that never helps us and kind of makes us solidify situations instead of being dynamic and moving forward. Let's go into uh, Abraham and Sarai. Uh, sorry, Abraham and Sarah are still moving on. But I want to talk further about Hagar again. Let's go all the way to verse 20 or chapter 21. So here we have Isaac who is now born and Isaac is circumcised as is the sign of the covenant. So for a second time, Hagar is threatened. And you see this in verse uh, chapter 21, verse 10. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. So in verse 14, Abraham uh, rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, gave it to Hagar, put it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. So for a second time, Hagar's out there on her own with her child in the wilderness, wandering, uh, 
she doesn't have a lot of resources. Now she's got a little child. Now she's got a little bit of bread, a little bit of water, but that's not going to last her and the child for very long. When the water was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes, and then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off. Now, why would she do that? Mothers generally hold their children, especially in difficult circumstances like this. And she said, this is her prayer. And this brings me to tears every time I read it. This is her prayer. Do not let me look on the death of the child. She can't even, she, she's past the point of even saying, don't let the child die. She's saying, just let me not have to witness it. As a mother, I have to say, that is the prayer at the bottom of my soul. I mean, that would be like worse than hitting rock bottom. Just don't let me have to see it is, is beyond despair. Despair would be my child is dying. Please, Lord, let him live. Beyond despair is there's nothing I can do. Just let me not have to perceive it. Now, remember, Hagar is all about seeing things. The God who sees me and how could I see God? And now she's saying, let me not see this. It's that tragic. And so she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of, the, of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Now, again, God knows what troubles her. God asks these probing questions. Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes. Now she can see. And what does she see? A well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. <laughs> wow. He's still the God who sees, who sees her. Even when her only prayer is, don't let me see as my beloved child dies. And God not only sees, but gives her provisions. Can we come to God that way? Can we come to God with our most intimate prayer, our most intimate lament, our most confused self, our deepest grief, our greatest anger, our greatest source of pain? Can we be that honest? And then can we also know you are El Roy, the God who sees me? And then just wait for provisions. I come back to Hagar time and time and time and time again. I have for many years. Hagar is the one that I come to when my father died and I'm just despairing. Hagar is the one that I come to, you know, when I hear that my mom has stage four lung cancer and she's not going to make it. Hagar is the one I come to when I'm with a drowned child in a hospital room. Hagar is the one that I come to when I don't understand why tens of thousands of people have died from COVID. When, I, when I'm at the bottom of my prayers, when I don't have hope, not when I do. There are other people that I go to when I have hope. You know, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat with all of his hope. But Hagar is the one I go to when I don't have hope. And I don't know how God's going to ever bring anybody through this. And then I say... You're still the one who sees. You're still the one who provides. I'm in the wilderness here, God, or I pray on behalf of somebody else who is. And I know God doesn't ever stop seeing. God's not a watchmaker. God has not turned away. It can feel like it, but emotions don't always tell us the truth of things. And the truth of things is that God would never leave his own. And his own include literally everybody. If it can include Hagar, it can include you and me. 
It can include everybody. God is the one who sees when people die alone from COVID-19, su supposedly alone in their hospital rooms on a ventilator, barely breathing, God sees and God provides. God gives provisions that we cannot understand. When people were in the Holocaust in the gas chambers, God saw. God always sees. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for being Elroy, the God who sees us. We ask you to continue to see and to provide, even in ways that we can barely understand. Thank you, God, for being who you are and for loving us. Thank you for this Bible study and helping us understand that these stories relate to us still today. I pray for everybody hearing this video. Strengthen them. Help them to see you, the one who sees them. Help them to understand that you will always provide for them. You'll always see them and know them. Thank you, God, for loving us so very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.